Hello and welcome to a one, another wonderful evening of conservation and research with our Holland Lifelong Learning. Thank you to Mary and Mason Holland and Chris Hawker of Ameriprise Financial for sponsoring tonight. Um, tonight, all about birds. Do we have any bird nerds in the audience here? Any bird nerds? I see a few hands. Okay. Hopefully a few online as well. We have quite the online audience with us this evening. To be honest, I was not a bird nerd two years ago. Didn't, they weren't the animals I was looking for. Didn't think about birds too much. Um, but actually working here at the aquarium and the birds that we have here uh, piqued my interest and then COVID hit. And I got some binoculars and I got a bird ID book and I really got into birding. So I am really thrilled about this evening's event here. And tonight we're going to get a glimpse into the world of our feathered friends with Nolan Schillerstrom from the South Carolina Audubon. So Nolan earned his Bachelor of Science in Environmental Studies and Biology from Cornell College in 2015. And earlier this year, he graduated with a Master's in Environmental and Sustainability Studies from the College of Charleston. Congratulations, Nolan. He spent the last seven years with Audubon, South Carolina, working to protect our coastal birds and bridging the natural and social sciences and empowering communities to adopt better practices that allowed for shared space between people and birds. His most recent and proudest project is working on the restoration of Crab Bank Seabird Sanctuary at the mouth of Shim Creek in Charleston Harbor. We're gonna hear a lot more about that later this evening. When he's not working, he spends his time photographing wildlife, playing music and guiding local kayak trips. So let's welcome Nolan Schillerstrom from South Carolina Audubon. Thank you, uh, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here to um, talk about uh, one of my favorite things, which is coastal birds. Um, and I will, you will likely see me do some dancing up here tonight. If you're, if you guys are really active with me, then maybe I'll try some bird calls, which I can't promise I'm very good at um, at all. Uh, but the, the topic of our, our talk tonight is eventually going to bring us to protecting birds by restoring and protecting seabird sanctuary islands in South Carolina. Um, but we have a path that I'd like to take us to get there eventually. Um, so a big part of my job is to is, uh, what I see as a big part of my job tonight is to make you fall a little bit more in love with the birds that you have right under your noses here on our beaches and in our marshes in South Carolina um, and help you realize the kind of beach habitats that um, maybe previously you would have only seen as recreational uh, space for people, but is in fact really fantastic habitat for birds too. And I'm thinking our public beaches um, that are right here in our backyard. Um, and these birds face a ton of challenges uh, and threats, um, but there are solutions that we're working very hard on with a large number of partners, um, a, a large one of which is the South Carolina Aquarium. Um, but we work with, with a cadre of partners um, like the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources and other nonprofits in the area to work on these solutions. Um, but a little bit about Audubon, South Carolina, we are, um, 501c3 nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to protecting birds in the places they need. Um, so a, a large part of our staff are biologists, but we also have an advocacy side to what we do. Um, and so if you're interested in learning more about that part of our work, uh, please feel free to ask questions uh, about what you can do at the state house um, and on the federal level. But um, we all love birds. That's kind of the thing that unites us um, as an organization. Um, and we love the landscapes here in South Carolina. So I'd like to take a step back um, and, and talk about why our little sliver of the world is so important to coastal birds. Um, an analogy that 
uh, author and researcher named Deborah Kramer often uses uh, when she describes the journey that red knot take every year is that our entire coastline is like a ladder to these birds. And these red knot in particular are traveling from their southern wintering locations in uh, as far south as Tierra del Fuego, which is the very southern tip of South America. Um, and then they'll fly all the way up the Atlantic coast to nest in the Arctic tundra um, in Canada. And for those birds to survive that long migration, they have to climb that ladder up and down every single year. Um, and for them to make that trip, as many rungs need to be intact as possible in that ladder. Now you could think about each rung as a country or as a state um, or as particular beaches in your backyard. Um, we have a pretty important rung in the scheme of things in South Carolina. Uh, just in our state alone, there's 187 miles of coastline, almost 2,000 tidal shorelines, and um, 35 barrier islands. And I'm going to come back to that number in a little bit when we start talking about our seabird sanctuaries. Uh, 35 barrier islands in South Carolina. Um, but now that we have a little bit of a background, right, I, I want to help you guys fall in love with these birds just a little bit more. Uh, there are many, many more species out there than just seagulls, which is what I think, uh, uh, I, I'm, I think this audience is probably a little bit more aware than um, than your typical population in Charleston or anywhere in the world, but um, we have a lot more going on on the beach than just seagulls. Um, and actually, I'm going to try and take this off to walk around. Um, so I would normally ask folks to name what birds you see up, up here, um, but I don't want to be discriminatory to our folks on, <laughs> online. So I'll point a couple of them out, but some of my favorites here, Dunlin, uh, Black Skimmer, uh, suite of tern species. We have our wimbrel, um, which if, you, if you've heard recently, a large flock of wimbrel was discovered roosting on uh, one of our seabird sanctuaries, Devo Bank, uh, by our friends at DNR. American oyster catchers is another favorite. Uh, but out of all these, these species that are up on the screen, I want to focus on the four that, that we think are most important um, to at least talk about. So piping plover, red knot, least tern, and Wilson's plover, these birds represent um, the, the full set of life strategies that these birds take um, th that we see here in South Carolina. So piping plover are here for about nine months out of the year, but they are mainly wintering here. So they're not going to lay eggs or nest, uh, but these are a, this is a threatened and endangered species. The red knot is a, a, a threatened, federally threatened species that migrates through South Carolina. And so we see them stopping over here in our state. And then the least tern is a nesting seabird that nests in colonies and the Wilson's plover is a nesting shorebird that is more of a cryptic nester in our state. And by doing good for these four species, we're actually doing good for all of the birds that we might see on the beach here in South Carolina what we call the umbrella effect, right? If we do good for those four, then we're doing good for most of the shorebirds and seabirds that we see in South Carolina. So I wanna tell a, a bit of a story about each one of these species um, and, and, and kind of show you why I love them each so much. Uh, the piping plover to start. So they are very similar to our nesting Wilson's plovers. Um, here in South Carolina. They kind of look like a semi-palmated plover, and, and honestly, they're very difficult to identify, but that light gray on their back is, uh, and the little stubby bill with the big eyes, that gives them away as a piping plover. Their legs also have that orange color to them. Um, now, they, they look a little bit different from the summer to the winter, but when you, when you see them here in South Carolina, they're probably spending most of their time feeding at low tide and just resting or roosting at high tide. Um, low tide, the food is exposed. And I'm gonna play this video up here, but I'm also gonna try and demonstrate this myself. But these piping plover um, do this little foot trembling motion. Uh, it's a little dance that they do where they, they have these huge, uh, very developed eyes that help them see on 
things moving around on the surface. And so what this piping plover is doing is he's trying to agitate the sand just a little bit to get whatever's hiding underneath marine worms or other little critters to move just a little bit to react to that agitation. And then you can see this piping plover after it sees that little hint of movement, will go after it and, and pull that worm up. There's some beautiful pictures um, out there of these birds pulling up worms, just <laughs> stringing it out of the sand. Um, so really fun to see these guys do this behavior. Um, and this videographer would not have seen this behavior if, if they were too close, right? Uh, and so what you'll actually see on the beach here is a little bit more difficult to see. So they might be hanging out in groups of four or five, sometimes more, um, but more often than not, you will not see them at all. <laughs> The picture that's up on the screen now, there's three piping clovers in the front of the picture. Oh, and, and all these photos were taken by a friend and a colleague, Ed Conrad, who um, photographs a lot of these things out on Seabrook Island. Um, but there's three little piping clovers in that picture that are extremely difficult to see. Um, piping clovers are, like I said, constantly hunting. There's a great picture of it pulling a worm out of the ground. Uh, that bird has some flashy leg bands on it. And there's another one, <laughs> right up at the front of that, the frame of this picture, and um, somebody is scoping them out from, from back, back behind a little bit. Um, they're often hiding in, in our rack line here, um, just trying to find a little bit of shelter. Um, but these birds, because they breed so far north, um, their breeding plumage, which you can see in that top left picture, is usually seen up north. And when they're down here, they're, their plumage is really made to blend in with their surroundings. And skipping, skipping next to the red knot, this is a, one of the longest migrants in the entire world. And when they show up here in early spring, or around mid-March, they actually kind of look, somebody described it to me one time as a dirty seagull. And that hurt my heart a little bit because red knot are so special to me, but um, it, it's kind of true. These, these birds in the background here still kind of have just a gray mottled look to them. Um, but, as they spend a couple weeks here fueling up on the food that is hiding in underneath the sand on our beaches, they will shed those gray feathers and regrow uh, nice bright red feathers um, like you see in these two pictures. But these birds are that species that I mentioned before as starting their journey in the winter um, in Brazil or Argentina or sometimes as far south as Tierra del Fuego and then traveling all the way up the coast and nesting in the Arctic tundra. And that round trip is about 19,000 miles every single year. Uh, these birds have a nickname, uh, the moon bird, if you have not heard that before. Moon bird ref uh, refers to uh, an individual red knot who was banded as a young bird, as a chick. And so we know exactly how old this bird is. And so the mileage that bird has flown from when it was born to now in the last, I, I want to say it's like between 13 and 15 years old at this point, but that bird has flown the same distance as it takes to get to the moon and halfway back. Um, extraordinary flyers, they completely alter their physiology to be able to survive that trip. And when they're here in South Carolina, they oftentimes are seen in the hundreds and sometimes in the thousands. Um, places like DeVoe Bank, Seabrook Island, um, Harbor Island um, are seabird sanctuaries that are a little bit more untouched than, than our, our public beaches uh, or more public beaches. We'll see thousands of these red knots all flocking together in one place. Um, these birds mostly feed on horseshoe crab eggs. Um, in fact, they follow horseshoe crab spawning up the coast every spring. Um, and one of the threats that they are actually uh, facing right now is, is we think a lack of food when they're here in South Carolina. Um, so when you see them on the beach, they are desperate to eat and rest and refuel. When I, when I talk about red knot with kids, we, we always go, what, what do red knot want to do? They want to sleep and they want to eat. So if you don't remember anything else about red knot, remember they want to sleep and they want to eat. 
when they're here. Um, so it's really important to keep our distance from them on the beach, but absolutely amazing birds. I could talk about them for hours. Least tern is a nesting seabird species in South Carolina. Um, these birds uh, are mostly only seen here in the summer. Um, and actually this is a picture of a nesting colony. They'll nest in large numbers. It's safety and power in numbers for these guys. Um, and their natural nesting habitat is actually on the beach, but does this look like a beach? Not so much. Actually, the majority of nesting least tern in South Carolina um, are on gravel rooftops throughout the state. And this to us is indicative that there just isn't enough undisturbed suitable beach habitat left for these guys to nest where they would actually like to, which is a lot closer to the water on sandy high ground away from vegetation. Um, our, uh, um, have to mention Mary Catherine Martin at South Carolina DNR monitors all the leaves turn throughout the state. And so all the information that we have about these guys are from our partners at DNR, uh, Mary Catherine in particular, um, an amazing biologist if you ever get the chance to meet her. But something I love to talk about with these birds, these pictures are also from Ed Conrad, um, but they have a really fun courtship behavior where in the beginning of their nesting season, which is the beginning of our summer, they, they, the females of this species will, will, I like to say, they'll, they'll loaf on the beach. They, they're hanging out, relaxing, and the males will go out and find the shiniest little silver fish that he can find. So he'll bring that fish back to a female on the beach and kind of waggle it in front of her face, trying to get her attention. And it's something about the quality of the fish or the size of the fish, or maybe the quality of the male's feathers that will help this female decide if she's interested or not. And in this case, uh, she was not interested. She flew away, unfortunately. Sorry, buddy. And so then after this happens, sometimes we'll see the males go and try with a different female with the same fish. Um, but sometimes he'll just eat the fish, um, <laughs> take his loss and go find another one. But sometimes these guys are successful. So here it is happening again. Again, these photos were expertly taken by, by uh, Mr. Conrad. She accepts the fish and he's a pretty proud looking male Eastern. You ask me. And so when this happens, it may happen a couple of times, but generally when this happens, these two will copulate and, um, and have a nest that year. Lay eggs and they have to protect those eggs for about a month. And then they have to protect the chicks after they hatch out of the eggs for about a month. Some of these pictures are from the Audubon Photography Awards. and Some of them are, are local again by Ed, but I love this one up top because that shows both mom and dad caring for the young. Those are two chicks that uh, one was sitting on the chicks, keeping them shaded and cool, and the other parent is bringing in fish for them to eat. Um, during the summer, oh, and here's another chick picture here in the bottom left. You might also see those yellow signs posted around least turn nesting areas. Um, these are posted by a couple different partners um, to designate uh, this nesting habitat where these guys are most likely to spend their time during the summer. Uh, I also love these birds because they will dive bomb anybody who gets too close. So you really know if you're too close to a eastern colony because like that bottom right picture that those these birds will come down at you. Um, so the fourth species that I want to talk about tonight is the Wilson's plover. Now the Wilson's plover is a nesting shorebird. So it looks very similar to our piping plover or semi-palmated plover or you know, other plover species. Um, and we are, we are plover lovers in, in South Carolina. This is a bird that is most likely to nest near or on public beaches. They're a little bit more tolerant of disturbance. Um, and so we're more likely to see these birds doing some pretty cool behavior. But, uh, their nests and chicks, just like all of our coastal birds, are extremely well camouflaged um, so that they can hide from predators. But if a predator does get too close to these extremely vulnerable but well hidden eggs and chicks, um, then they have a pretty fun behavior that I'll, I'll demonstrate for you all in a second. But you can see this picture. There are a couple eggs that that 
um, female Wilson's plover is standing over. Um, and then that picture to the right is an example of what, what some shorebird eggs might look like. And then those chicks down at the bottom, I think they're the cutest little baby birds in the world. Little puff balls on stick legs. Um, so I've said it before, but I'll, I'll say it again. Mom and dad, uh, for all of our coastal birds, really have to sit on those eggs, not to keep them warm, but to keep them cool enough to survive the summer heat. And so when a predator gets too close, mom and dad are pretty desperate to get that predator away so that they can go back to sitting on their eggs and sitting on their chicks. And our uh, piping plovers, kill deer do this as well, but Wilson's plovers have this behavior called a broken wing display where they push one or both wings up against the, well, first of all, they'll fly up to that predator, whether it be a raccoon or um, a perceived predator like a person or a dog, and they will pretend to have a broken wing. It looks kind of like this. And it makes hurt sounding squeaky sounds to get that predator's attention and draw it away from its eggs and its chicks. So these are some of the best bird parents, I think, in the world. Because they're th literally throwing themselves in front of that danger in order to protect their young. And once they're far enough away from the eggs, of course, they'll, they're fine. They, they hop up and they'll fly back to their eggs to go sit down. Um, these birds are, uh, they, they have a notable black necklace on. The males have a, a darker black band. The females have a, a lighter brown band. But they, they spend all summer long taking care of their young, finding food for their young, scouting out nesting territories, and sitting on those eggs. But I love me some Wilson's plovers. They also have, if, if you're a, um, trying to ID these guys, they also have a notably larger black bill on them um, compared to other plover species. So again, we, we focus on those four important species because they, they kind of represent the life strategies of a lot of other different birds that are at risk of becoming threatened without conservation efforts like our black skimmers or American oyster catchers or a willet up on the top half of the screen. Um, and then our decline, we have a lot of uh, wintering or migratory birds that are also declining, um, like our sanderling, our wimbrel, or ruddy turnstone. Um, and our shorebirds in North America uh, in the last uh, 40 years have declined on average about 70%. Um, and so just think about 40 years ago, for every 100 birds you, you could see back then on the beach, there's about 30 left today. Um, it's, it's a pretty drastic decline. And so what we're getting to this, this, these really cool solutions and, and how you can help also protect these birds. Um, and so the next step in that process is to go over what kind of habitat these, these birds actually like. Um, and it turns out that uh, beaches that people love to go to are also the beaches that these birds love to use as well. Um, and that is kind of, can be kind of a good thing, but uh, for these birds, it, can sometimes be a bad thing too. But I like to rank the two different kinds of beach birds in terms of whether they're a migratory bird stopping over in South Carolina or they're a nesting bird that lay eggs here in South Carolina. Um, so for our migratory birds, um, across the board, even if it's not a red knot, these guys are logging thousands of miles before they get here to our state. Uh, and when they're here, they really just want to rest and refuel so that they can survive the rest of their migration. Often hanging out in the intertidal zone on beaches. Um, and uh, like, like I have said before, at low tide, they are spending all their time foraging because that's when the food is exposed. And then at high tide, they are roosting, um, sometimes on docks that are... Um, left more untouched at high tide and sometimes at high tide roosting areas on the beach. Um, but keeping that in mind, uh, you know, after a long trip, after I get home from a long trip, um, I really, really want to eat and I want to sleep too, right? <laughs> uh, when I get off of a plane or get out of the car, it's exhausting, right? For me, that's kind of a luxury to be able to do that. 
But for these guys, when they stop and land, it's really because they have to. Uh, for them, this is life or death. And so uh, running through a flock of birds on the beach can be extremely detrimental to their survival. Um, but when they're left untouched, we can observe some pretty interesting behaviors. So you may notice if you're ever lucky enough to see a large group of shorebirds foraging on the beach that um, some, in some areas, there are sometimes dozens, if not hundreds of birds all foraging in the same area. In a lot of other uh, animal groups, you might think that they would be competing for resources. But with shorebirds, because they each have different length bills, different shaped bills, they're, they are able to use the same area of beach and not have to get in each other's way. They don't have to compete with each other. And so like our American oyster catchers, they're going after oysters and, and a lot of the stuff that's on the very surface level. I've even seen them eating horseshoe crab eggs, actually. Um, American oyster catchers, believe it or not. Um, but I, I mean, who loves oysters? I love, I love oysters. These guys love oysters. You guys would get along great. Um, birds like, um, like Wimbrel or Eastern Curlew, uh, which actually we don't really have any other Curlew species coming through South Carolina in large numbers, but um, those birds with the larger uh, curved, decurved bills, they're going after some of that stuff deeper in the sand versus a plover um, or a willet or a dowager, right? Um, and then our nesting species, of course, we've mentioned uh, Wilson's plover, but American oyster catchers are also a pretty commonly seen nesting bird in the state. Now, and then willet, of course, that's another nesting shorebird species. And then our brown pelicans, royal terns, um, least tern, uh, there's a whole suite of seabirds as well. But the places that these birds prefer to nest are these offshore, un more undisturbed places, uh, like our Devoe banks, or like our crab banks, or bird keys, or like our, our drive or beaches that you can drive to, like Seabrook Island and Captain Sam's over on Kiowa. Um, these places, they, they look kind of similar, don't they? Um, it, it's this habitat that is a long, sprawling, sandy beach. Uh, it could be a shelly substrate, too, but you might notice that on these areas, that's mostly sand here, there's not much vegetation. And this is really what these birds prefer. The vegetation is not able to grow because these places are also, also have ephemeral qualities where every 10 to 15 years, there might be a little bit of washover from a large storm or um, a high tide. Um, we think that that is, if they choose these kinds of places, one, because they can see predators coming from a long way off. This is where their food is. Um, and also because maybe that washover every now and then prevents avian ticks or other critters from growing in their nest that might prevent them from having a successful nesting season. Now, I also like to encourage folks to think about places like Folly Beach or Sullivan's Island um, as places that could be really suitable for these birds um, as well. And oftentimes they are on certain places and at certain times of the year. So we can maybe skip over this, but really I, I used to think that there was a shorebird season uh, that we, we saw a lot of birds, like maybe that was breeding season. That's when all these birds are active, um, but really there's no such thing as a shorebird season. There are birds here year round that utilize our beaches. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on spring migration as they're moving up north, stopping over in the state uh, and then breeding season when they nest. But um, as they migrate back down in the fall, and then here we are now in wintering season, uh, they, these birds, there are shorebirds that need our help here pretty much year round. Um, for those piping plovers, which are threatened and endangered, it's about nine months out of the year. And, and so I've kind of touched on these a little bit already, these conservation challenges that these birds face. Um, and there are a couple but this cartoon kind of sums it up. So on Monday, this American oyster catcher duo is scoping out their nesting site. They're building a nest and as opposed to uh, other shorebirds that just dig out a little scrape in the sand, these guys actually do decorate the nest with some shells sometimes, uh, but still very camouflaged. 
talking about getting excited for for their clutch for the chicks to hatch eventually and um lo, lo and behold though they, they laid three eggs which is usually the maximum clutch size for an american oyster catcher but then set friday saturday sunday come through and there are just too many people that come to the beach um, wanting to enjoy the beach probably not even knowing that there's an american oyster catcher pair trying to nest um, bringing dogs throwing frisbees maybe a little bit too close to their nest and um by the time Monday comes around, those two birds will have had to abandon their nest. Uh, even if their eggs haven't been broken or directly stepped on, if there's too much disturbance at a site, birds will, will be forced to abandon um, because they realize this is too dangerous for me to raise my young here. And so there's a lot of, we're gonna get a little bit depressing before we get uh, happy again, but there are a lot of natural threats that these birds face too from um, storms and high tides, uh, even a nor'easter paired with a high tide can sometimes wash over nesting areas. Um, so these birds know that they have to nest above that high tide line, but what happens when there's a big storm, right? Um, it can cause washover. And then there's natural predators too, that a lot of stuff wanna eat these nutritious eggs and chicks. And if they can find them, that's a very nutritious meal. Um, they have avian predators, crows, owls, uh, gulls will go after them. I've seen ghost crabs and then mammalian predators going after them too, raccoons included. <clears throat> um, and so out of all of these, these, um, these challenges, right, there's, there's one that rises to the top in the research. And that is recreational disturbance. Um, this is the greatest preventable threat to shorebirds and seabirds in South Carolina. Um, we put a lot of time and resources into educating folks about, um, about this issue and to try and uh, create ways to share the beach with these birds. And so the gist of this is that, that if you build it, and luckily our, our beaches in South Carolina don't look, you know, we don't have Ferris wheels on the beach, but um, if you build it, they will come. And unfortunately that pushes out these other animals that rely on uh, these beaches too. Um, and on a, on a beach that otherwise would look perfect for, for a shorebird to roost or feed on, um, by the time 8 a.m., 9 a.m. rolls around, you know, you could have runners coming on the beach just enjoying their day, um, people riding bikes, walking, bringing dogs on leashes or off leashes, um, boats coming up to, to land or, or and, and come enjoy the day on the beach, kites or kite borders, um, sometimes people driving on the beach. And then, um, and honestly, I did this when I was a little kid. I ran through flocks of shorebirds <laughs> and seabirds. It's fun to see them fly around. Uh, but, you know, little did I know that that, that can be really harmful for them. Um, so what qualifies as recreational disturbance? Well, pretty much all of these things. Uh, it, it encompasses all of these activities that humans participate on while at the beach. Um, and the gist of it is that, that flushing birds does cause, it can cause nest failure and then energy loss for migration. Um, and I have a dog and I'll bring it to certain areas of the beach, but um, unfortunately dogs are a big part of the problem on some beaches too. <laughs> this is a complete, completely a joke. Again, I love dogs, <laughs> um, but on leash or off leash, uh, you know, even if they're on leash, uh, just seeing that dog from a certain distance away can get birds up off the nest. Um, and we already kind of went over these, but drones too have been a big issue recently. Um, people setting up too close to nesting areas. But we, we truly believe that there are solutions to this. Um, out of those 35 barrier islands uh, that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, really there are just a handful of places where these birds can safely nest and rest on the beach. And so um, what, we, what we might see as uh, not super consequential, you know, flushing through a flock of birds, um, if those birds fly up and have to move somewhere else, there's really not too many other places for them to go nowadays. And so the first step to solving this issue, we really believe is, is raising awareness about these birds and this plight that they face. Um, conservation does believe with human awareness. Um, and one way that we address this is through a shorebird stewarding program uh, 
uh, this is another picture from Seabrook Island uh, where a shorebird steward program has actually just recently started, but we have uh, 10 sites across the state where volunteers are trained and they go out and interact with beachgoers uh, near these important nesting and migratory habitats to encourage folks to keep your distance from the birds and then enjoy them from a distance. So we'll bring binoculars out and have spotting scopes set up. Um, and these volunteers are, are the boots on the ground that we need to start giving these birds a chance to survive out on the beach. Um, and so we, we started this uh, full force in about 2016 and um, come to today, uh, stewarding is, is, is the foundation of a lot of other great work that's come down the line. So if you wanna get involved as a steward, please let me know and, and we will get you trained up uh, by February this year and um, get you out on the beach to start to help out uh, educate folks on the beach. 99.5% um, of the time, our interactions with people on the beach are, oh, wow, th thank you for telling me. I did not know that. And, and we've been able to see American oyster catchers raise their chicks successfully, and Wilson's plovers come back to beaches, and least turn coming back to public beaches where they would not otherwise have had a chance. Um, and now to, uh, to turn it around back to our our original topic about creating habitat for these birds. So um, Laura mentioned that uh, Crab Bank Seabird Sanctuary is, is a most recent and probably proudest project that I've had the pleasure of working on recently. Um, and I'd like to kind of walk you guys through what it took to make Crab Bank happen and, and um, step by step from where we started to where we are now to rebuild this important sanctuary island. Um, so in the state, there are only five seabird sanctuary islands that exist. And so remember that there's 35 barrier islands in the state, um, almost 200 miles of coastline, but there are only five little slivers of beach where these birds can really call, call home. They're off limits to people landing and, um, and disturbing the birds. And so that makes it so that this small handful of places can be really successful for a lot of our seabirds and shorebirds. So Crab Bank Island, uh, Crab Bank Seabird Sanctuary, if you are not already familiar, is in Charleston Harbor. I'm gonna zoom in on this map a little bit. And it is near the mouth of Shemp Creek. It's kind of by Old Village, Mount Pleasant. And so this aerial photo, that little sliver of beach was from um, recently, I think it was just last year from Google Maps. Um, and so, we and a lot of other partners, uh, DNR, um, uh, US Army Corps of Engineers, the Aquarium, um, Coastal Conservation League, Coastal Expeditions Foundation, um, SC Wildlife Federation, and a whole lot of other partners um, worked with us at Audubon to turn this little sliver of beach into a 28 to 32 acre island yet again. Um, this has always been a dredge disposal site for um, dredging in, in the harbor. Or, or it was originally, um, and this most recent renourishment was tied to this Charleston Harbor deepening that you've probably been seeing happen out in the harbor. All those dredge ships that are out there with their lights on 24-7, um, those are all tied directly to uh, not only the deepening of the port's uh, pathway for those larger ships to come through, but also to the growth of Crab Bank Seabird Sanctuary. Um, this island, in its prime, was host to 5,000 nests in a single year of brown pelicans, royal tern, American oyster catchers, all these birds that really need our help. And it's also always been an island for, uh, for the people, right? Uh, this is, this is our, our friend Nancy Swan, who um, this trophy is from 1989 when they had a sailing uh, competition around the island. Um, it's always been a perfect example of a place that benefits both birds and people. Um, and it's uh, about to be that yet again. Um, so just to give you an idea about the other seabird sanctuaries in the state, Tompkins Island, DeVoe Bank, Bird Key, Crab Bank, and Marsh Island are all part of this sanctuary system that uh, DNR and the Fish and Wildlife Service own and manage. Um, so just to give you some perspective on, on the little piece of the puzzle that this island represents. So walking it back to uh, 2003, these are pictures taken by biologists that were doing surveys out there at the time on the old crab bank. 
So 2003, uh, pretty vegetated and, and pretty large. It was 20, 30-ish acres back then. Uh, moved to 20, 2006, uh, and Crab Bank has changed a lot, but always been this seabird haven, 2008. And then fast forward to when they started doing aerial surveys, 2011, and I love this picture because you can see the, these little clusters of uh, royal tern there, the brown pelicans here, and then further off, um, you can see least tern and black skimmers all in their own little, <laughs> little pods. Um, and then in 2018, a nor'easter paired with a high tide washed away all the eggs on the island. Uh, we actually saw these eggs washing up on Sullivan's Island and Isle of Palms. Um, this year, uh, 2018, was Crab Bank's first year as a productive zero. Um, and since then, brown pelican nesting increased on other islands nearby, but um, there was kind of this hole created. Um, and I might kind of skip through this stuff because we want to focus on the birds, but uh, Crab Bank benefited a lot of people. It was a huge educational opportunity for kids and, and um, people coming to visit Shem Creek. Uh, it also blocked some wave energy that was coming into Shem Creek and um, those houses along the shoreline. But the next couple pictures are also going to keep moving forward in time, but the story gets better from here because we were able to work with all those partners to raise enough money to uh, take that dredge material from the Charleston Harbor deepening and then use it to restore Crab Bank to what you see them working on out there right now today. So this is early 2018. Um, there's still a couple nests out here on the island. They're just kind of hanging onto that sliver of beach. And then it all washed over mid 2018. And um, that's when these, these fundraising efforts started to try and raise, raise uh, we had a pretty big number to reach to um, give to the Army Corps so that they could put that sand onto Crab Bank. Um, and so then March of 2020 is the next photo. And then June of 2020, um, at this point, luckily, all of the funds were raised through individual donations, through corporations, um, as well as a NIFWIF grant that uh, we were able to apply for and to help pay for the construction as well. And earlier this fall, they actually started doing the dredging. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about this if anybody has questions, but it's actually a really interesting process. Um, they basically drill and suck up the, the sand that they were going to dredge anyway, and then pump it through this pipeline out onto what they're going to turn into the new crab bank. So then the next couple of pictures just go through kind of week, every two or three weeks. So in just two weeks, this is what it looked like. Um, and actually off to the side here, there were black skimmers and gulls and some pelicans already hanging out. We, we kind of joked that the birds approve of the island already. Um, I think they were really just going after some of the food that was getting kicked up by the dredge. <laughs> um, and then October 19th, the island is growing. November 2nd, um, here's another angle on November 2nd, um, the island is almost finished and it will be a total of uh, 28 to 32 acres yet again for birds like brown pelicans and royal tern and American oyster catchers and black skimmers all to nest yet again. Um, and so it's been a, a, an amazing project to work on uh, and it's been a long road to get it to where we are now, but this I hope will be a framework for future collaborations to keep building habitat like Crab Bank or perhaps raising marshes to a level that they can keep up with sea level rise um, and keep building habitat for birds while we protect the shorelines behind those islands at the same time, right? So that's all that I have today and I'm glad to take any questions, but. If you were inspired to volunteer, please, please send me an email or visit our website to sign up. Um, and if you wanna help protect coastal birds, the SC Aquarium has some amazing programs for coastal birds and a lot of our coastal wildlife. Um, and we have our coastal program that we also fundraise for. Um, so thank you all for listening and it's been a pleasure to speak.
Thank you so much, Nolan. We are going to open it up to questions to our in-person and virtual audience. So I'll start in person here. I have a quick question. When you mentioned the Wilson's clovers, you said that you had seen them nesting um, on rooftops. Was it Wilson's that were on rooftops or, wait a minute, not Wilson's. Uh, Lease turn, Lease maybe? turns, yeah, I've took some notes and I'm, I just lost my place. But the ones that are nesting on the rooftops, are we seeing any issues because of the heat on those rooftops with, um, a uh, hatch rate or anything like that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, um, and, and this is all information that, that what has been communicated to us from our uh, partner at DNR. Um, but rooftop nesting is definitely not ideal. Um, a lot of those rooftops underneath the gravel is a layer of uh, sticky tar. Um, and so when that heats up, the birds don't have very many places to go find shade themselves. Um, there's no rack, you know, there's no, um, there's no driftwood up on those rooftops that they can sit under. And so we do see overheating of eggs on those rooftops. Um, and then in, in some of the worst cases, the worst pictures I've seen have been birds or chicks getting caught in that sticky tar um, or running off the edge of the rooftop and getting lost on the ground. Um, so yeah, it, it's definitely not ideal. And Kendall, one of our virtual viewers, asked, other than the Audubon's Christmas bird count, are there any other citizen science programs that you would recommend? Yeah, so um, definitely the Shorebird Steward Program uh, to get out and talk to people. Um, we also have a couple different uh, human disturbance related projects that we run on the beach. Um, kind of it's been every other year for the past three years but it involves surveying the beach to count birds and count people and kind of figure out how these people are interacting but we also run a, a bald eagle survey every year and the christmas bird count is a great one but then i always also encourage people to submit your birding data to ebird.org um, that helps a lot that data gets used in big studies all the time Another virtual viewer, Matt, was asking about the best places to safely view nesting shorebirds. And then are those the same places that you would be stewarding at? Yeah, so uh, most often those are the same places that we would be stewarding at. So some of the best places to view them um, from a distance with a spotting scope or a really long uh, telephoto camera lens um, are, are um, our, our like uh, Folly Beach Lighthouse Inlet has been a really good one nearby. Um, if you are able to get onto Seabrook Island, they have some really cool nesting activity out there every year. But um, if you keep your eyes open and your ears open when you're out on the beach in the spring and, and the summer, you're bound to see some cool coastal bird activity no matter what beach you're on. Um, and so I would encourage you to, to just explore as many beaches as you can, but please keep your distance from those areas and from the birds uh, when you do see them. Yes. Didn't there used to be a camera on, a live camera on Crab Bank? Are yeah. they, are, are, do you think that they're going to do, I mean, that to me was great information for people to see and to, to buy into. Um, the interest in that. Do you think they'll do that again? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I can tell you for certain that uh, we will be doing that again. So, so that camera was knocked down. Um, I think it was 2018. And then um, CCL actually took that camera and put it over onto Shoots Folly. Um, there was some pelican nesting happening over there behind the marsh that, that uh, people could view. But um, part of the grant that we were able to get to help pay for construction costs, we're, we're, we were able to loop in some uh, uh, a, a way for that grant money to apply to a new camera that we're going to put out on, on the crab bank. Um, so there will be a new Pelicam, definitely. Um, that, that's a great question. That's something that we have been working with the Coastal Conservation League on to get that back, camera back up, definitely. And then a related question to that is, will vegetation be planted on crab bank? Yeah, so we actually expect vegetation to grow on its own without us doing anything at all. Um, if there is a need for vegetation or um, 
or, or something in the future, then that's something we'll explore if the veg doesn't take naturally. But yeah, we, all the experts are, are telling us that that veg should grow on its own. You mentioned the uh, five uh, sanctuary islands, and I was just wondering if there are not uh, private property owners that would be willing to uh, designate a certain area of their property for sanctuary for birds. There's a program like that. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think in in a couple of cases that has happened. Like, um, what used to be private property is now um, uh, wildlife management area or. Um, so like I'm thinking, I think St. T. Coastal Reserve is a really great coastal area that um, is managed for wildlife now. Um, but I think the, the possible habitats along the coast are, are, are kind of running out. <laughs> um, there's only so much land and, and beach area left, right? And so I think there are a couple private beaches that um, that that could happen for definitely. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Kind of. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, that's a good idea. Continuing with Crab Bank, we have another question from our virtual viewers. Okay. Um, how long do they think the new crab bank will last? Yeah, so in the pre-construction studies that the Army Corps released, uh, crab bank should last at least 50 years. Um, and I, I think that's the standard that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers goes by uh, for, for this project. So at, at least 50 years, that's what we know. Uh, and we'll... I, I, I think us and all the other partners will do everything in our power to make sure it stays a little bit longer than that, right? <laughs> Definitely. And then we had a question about a specific bird about where uh, skimmers are nesting. Yeah, yeah. So there are not many skimmer nesting areas in the state. Um, they're really prone to disturbance um, and it, it really changes from year to year. So it's kind of difficult to say where they're going to nest next year. Last year, it was on a really ephemeral uh, sandbar that stayed dry for the majority of the year. Um, but they, they will attempt to nest on um, our seabird sanctuary islands and, and are often, often run off, unfortunately, by people getting too close. Do we have any more questions from our in-person audience here? I want to say another thank you again to Nolan for joining us this evening. A really great night. Hopefully, if you didn't raise your hand as a bird nerd in the beginning, you are chirping to a different tune now. I again want to thank our sponsors, Mary and Mason Holland and Chris Cocker of Ameriprise Financial. And this is our last Holland of 2021. We will be back in January with Sam Norton from Karen Farm. So look for that coming soon. But in the meantime, um, starting next week, we do have Aquarium Aglow happening in the evening, mostly uh, Thursday through Sunday evenings through the new year. Um, so we hope to see you there uh, and then back here in January. So thank you all so much for coming out tonight.